So first of all, I just want to um, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Dr. Benjamin Young. I'm an assistant professor of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness at the Wilder School of Government and Public Affairs at VCU. Uh, my co-host tonight is our department chair, uh, Professor Maureen Mazel benway and we are delighted to have you all join us tonight. Uh, and before we get in, uh, before we get into the talk, uh, I kind of wanted to give a, um, a brief context as to what we'll be discussing and the current situation in our country regarding the rise of far right extremism. Uh, on August 11th, 2017, a mob of angry white supremacists and far right extremists gathered in Charlottesville, Virginia for the Unite Be, the Unite Be Right rally. Uh, this public display of white supremacy extremism shocked millions of Americans with calls of, quote, Jews will not replace us to blood and soil. It was clear that the far right had gone from the dark depths of the internet into the mainstream. They felt comfortable enough to walk the campus of the University of Virginia and spout their hateful uh, rhetoric. In recent years, the far right has become emboldened and resurgent across the Western world. In 2019, the Global Terrorism Index discovered there was a startling 320% increase in white nationalist terrorism in North America and Europe over a span of just five years. This rapid increase in white power militancy cut, has caught the attention of US national security officials and our intelligence community. A 2020 report from the US Department of Homeland Security cast white supremacy as the greatest terror threat to Americans. Moreover, after the January 6th Capitol insurrection, it is clear now that the far right represents a distinct threat to US Homeland Security and our democratic system. Uh, tonight, in collaboration with the Virginia Holocaust Museum, uh, the Weiler School's uh, Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness Program is delighted to host our guest speaker, Shannon Foley-Martinez, who will tell us about the dangers posed by the far right. Shannon is a former violent white supremacist and has two decades in developing community resource platforms aimed at inoculating individuals against violence-based lifestyles and ideologies. Shannon has worked in at-risk communities, teaching and developing dynamic re resiliency skills. Uh, Shannon will be talking to us tonight about her radicalization and de-radicalization processes and the strategies we should take to combat the rise of far-right extremism. It is my distinct pleasure tonight to introduce you to Shannon Foley-Martinez. Thank you all so much for having me and hosting me. Um, I know that uh, hopefully my connection stays stable. There's it, a whole lot of wind here. So the tornado storms that blew through are still bringing a bunch of wind. So hopefully, my connection will stay stable enough uh, while we are here um, okay. that and it doesn't dip out. Yeah, it's uh, today has definitely been an interesting <laughs> in terms of uh, windy weather. Uh, so, Shannon, as we as we talked about, we, we kind of want this to be a discussion, um, and then we'll we'll do uh, quite a bit of Q and A at the end. So, I guess my first question to you is: um, Can you tell us a bit about your background and how you got involved in the white extremist movement? Sure. And like, I'll, I'll give just for the sake of using our time. Well, um, if you Google Shannon Foley Martinez, um, there is, there's, you know, that there are many places where my story is the, the longest form of which, um, was, uh, in yes, uh, exclamation mark, uh, magazine. And so you can read my story in more detail and about my work that I do that I'm that I'm engaged in in now. Um, the very briefest version of this story. It's always hard power movement from the time I was 15 until I was 20 and I'm 47 now. And so it's kind of like, give, tell us like about, you know, until you were 20 years old in like five, five minutes or whatever, um, and make it make sense when part of that story is that you were a Nazi, right? <laughs> so that is always, that is always a challenge. But the very briefest version of that story is that, um, that I grew up in a household where from very young, I felt like the black sheep in my family, and I felt like I didn't really belong in my family. 
Um, there are a lot of assumptions that people make about who they think is at highest risk for radicalizing into like hate violence or dehumanization. And one of the things that, um, you know, because I always have to self-examine, like what, what is the purpose of me sharing my story with people? Is it just like this like white redemption narrative? Like what is, what is the value of me sharing this with other people? And I have come to the conclusion that one of the values is that um, who we think is at highest risk is not really who is at highest risk. And that I defy nearly every stereotype that people have um, about who's at highest risk. Like I am a woman. Um, we assume like, I, this is a, this is male, this, these are males that are, that are at highest risk. Um, I, my parents, uh, I was, grew up in a two parent household. My parents are still married after 50 years. Um, there was no overt like substance abuse in my home. I grew up, um, I was born in 1974, so grew up in the late 70s, early 80s, um, and uh, so there was no, while there was no physical abuse in my home, um, there was, you know, like, like, you know, that there was, that there was, you know, like corporal punishment, but it was not outside the societal norm at the time, so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't interpreted by me as like, oh my gosh, my parents are, you know, like, are, are abusing me or anything like that. Um, so, and from the outside, um, it looked, you know, like I was living this very idyllic life that my parents were upwardly mobile middle class. They were involved in my like after school activities and things like that. But inside my home, things were incredibly dysfunctional. Um, and I came wired as someone who wanted to know why things were the way that they were and I wanted to understand like how things were connected and so like six-year-old Shannon in first grade was standing in front of her teacher just being like okay well why do I have to do homework if I can already get A's on your test right so from a very young age I was like challenging this idea of like who gets to have legitimate authority over me and standing there just being like well make it make sense to me if you can make it make sense then I will give you my assent but this doesn't make sense at all. Um, and growing up in a household where conformity and just like head down, get your education, fit in, don't rock the boat, um, that I just came sort of wired as a boat rocker. And so there was always like all of this stuff going on. And I didn't, you know, I was like, well, why do I care what people's opinions are of, of me or whatever? Um, and I talk, a, a lot of times I frame it as like I grew up Kind of like on a set of stranger things, but without the demigorgons. <laughs> that is like, you know, like uh, it was con this neighborhood connected by this network of sidewalks. If you knocked on enough doors, you could always find someone to play with. I was very active in multiple sports. Um, I was a championship athlete in multiple sports. I was in gifted programs uh, and things like that. And so while the first part of my childhood looked like this, but on the in like on the inside of my household, the rules were always changing. The boundaries were very unclear. Um, it was very, it felt very much like a meritocracy where it was just like, if you follow the rules and you do everything you're supposed to do, we like give you all of our love. And if you're, you know, like if you're not doing that, then we kind of like withdraw our love. Um, and it was, so for me as a child, my experience was one that was like very inconsistent and very confusing for me, especially as someone who was like, tell me why the rules are what they are. Um, and then I can like follow them or whatever for it to be, you know, like something jumping down the stairs or whatever, that would be okay at like 11 o'clock during the day was suddenly like a punishable offense at seven o'clock at night when the adults were tired um, or, or whatever, that, that, that it left me feeling very unsafe all of the time. When I was 11 years old, we moved from just outside of Philadelphia um, to rural Southern Michigan, just north of Toledo, Ohio. And when we got there, um, that sense of not really belonging expanded from inside my household out into the greater world. That when I got there, I didn't dress the same as everyone else or listen to the same music or have the same hair. And my Philly accent was like so strong that people, the like, kids were like, are you from England? And I was like, you know, I was like, no use guys. Like, I just want a glass of water. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. And so 
like there was this sense, so there was this sense where I really was now kind of like this this outsider. And I did make some friends, but they had all been friends their whole lives. And so I really struggled to kind of find this like peer group. And because I felt like such an outsider that during early adolescence, like part of the work of early adolescence is beginning to like posit your identity where you're just like, okay, who am I? Who do I choose to be in the world? What am I keeping from my family? What am I rejecting from my family? What am I adding on in addition to that? And because I felt like an outsider, I was very drawn to countercultures. The first of which was actually like 1960s, like anti-war counterculture. Apartheid was still happening. I was actually like very virulently like anti-apartheid. Um, I read a lot of books, listened to a lot of music. And through that, like ended up meeting like skateboarders and through like skateboarding ended up in the the punk rock scene you know and for me like that 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 felt like a good fit because it was like okay none of us feel like we belong anywhere so we choose to kind of belong together when it came time for me and I was uh, but at the time like while I was in middle school I was still like playing sports and because I had because I was still playing sports um, I, I had throughout my life, um, I had a lot of coaches that I was really close to. And so I still like had adults in my life where the rules were really clear and that, you know, it did feel like I was supported and things like that. When it came time for me to go to high school, I chose to go across the border from where we lived in Michigan to a private high school in Toledo, Ohio that the academics were a little bit better. Um, and, you know, I mean, I was a 14 year old girl. So, you know, it's like, I still wanted to like make my parents proud and, you know, it's like, Oh yeah. Yeah. Like, of course I want to go to college and, and do, you know, do all the things, your version of success. Right. But when I got there, there was a law in place at the time that if you, um, lived out of state and attended school in, um, in Ohio that you couldn't play sports. And um, so for the first time in my entire life, I no longer had like regular contact with coaches. Um, I was no longer playing sports. And I did like do some other things like student government and model UN and things like that. But it's, you know, it's like, it's not quite the same when you come home and you're like the security council really kicked butt today, as opposed to like, we just won the championship. Yeah, like it had to like this whole like sort of different, this different thing. Um, and so I really like I was I, I I did make again like I did make some friends, but they like it wasn't I didn't have like a big peer group. I felt really outside of all of the like sort of like cliques and everything that that were there. Um, at the end of my freshman year, I ended up doing what so many teenagers do, and uh, I went to a party where I lied um, about where I was going so that I could go spend the night at this party. Um, and I started drinking as soon as I got there. By the end of the night, I would be sexually assaulted by two men. Um, they were white men. Uh, people very often ask that because they, you know, they want stories into like hate and violence to be very linear and they very rarely are. Um, and when I woke up the next morning after that, I had two thoughts. The first one was that, like, did this really happen? And when I was like, okay, yes, this really happened. My very next thought that, that there was no way in hell that I could tell my parents that this happened, that throughout my childhood, their very first reaction to my brother or I being hurt or sick or anything that made them feel sort of like disempowered and out of control, that their very first response was to yell at us. Um, you know, that it was like, you would come in with like a bloody face and they, you know, and, and their first response would be like, how many times have we told you not to play tackle football in the backyard? Or how many times have we told you not to climb trees barefoot or whatever? I think there was this protective part of me that knew that I could not deal with um, the additional trauma of being shamed and blamed and yelled at for what had happened to me in addition to having to like deal with what had happened to me. And so I took all of that trauma completely unprocessed and shoved it down. And as we know, unprocessed trauma does not dissipate, it festers. 
And in my case, it festered into like deep self-loathing and self-hatred and manifested mainly as rage that I didn't understand and I didn't have the skills and tools to deal with. Um, I wanted to hurt myself, which I did, and anyone and anything I came in contact with, like I just wanted to like hurt and break and break down. On the periphery of the punk rock scene where I was, the angriest people that I knew were the white power skinheads that were like at most of the concerts that that um, that were happening and everything. And they fought, they got in fights at every single show, but they all also always like kind of like had each other's backs and everything. Um, and I think the rage within me really resonated with the rage that they displayed. Um, and I started hanging out with them more and more. Um, I see now that what happened was that I began at that point to build what would become like a physical echo chamber. And we hear that like now in terms of the internet, but for me, it was before the internet uh, or at least before the internet was something besides happening in, you know, garages and basements in California. Um, and, um, I started like listening to the music that they were listening to. So it was like white power music. And that like gave me access to some of the like conspiracy theories and beliefs and the language that were like an inherent part of the white power scene. I began to read like some of the zines that were out there and some of the books and literature that would, that were the cornerstones um, of, um, you know, of, of that belief system. And I began to only spend time with, um, uh, you know, with white supremacists and with, you know, particularly neo-Nazi skinheads. Very interestingly, and, and I bring this up too because I know that we are being co-hosted by the Holocaust Museum, that very interestingly in that, in the very first crew of skinheads, that was about like five people that I, that I hung out with there when I was, uh, I turned 15 a couple weeks after that sexual assault. So I was radicalizing as I was a 15 year old. Interestingly, as a sophomore in high school, as a 15 year old, I was actually like president of my student class as I was radicalizing um, into violent neo-Nazism. Um, that um, one of the guys in this crew was actually a big black guy named Carlos who self-identified as a Nazi and was completely accepted um, that there throughout my, you know, for almost five years in the movement that there were that there was very often this exceptionality um, for people, you know, like if you had a personal connection or whatever, that there was like this exceptionality, even though all of the rhetoric, you know, was was out there. And some of the work that I do now is mentoring people as they leave um, uh, extreme right wing spaces and like I like I currently have about 10 Jews that I am that I am mentoring um, that were part of, you know, everything like from the alt right to um, to other more like violent iterations of extreme right wing um, ideologies and networks and stuff. Um, and so that um, the idea of the complexity of identity that is like inherent in this um, I, I think is something that is is worth thinking about. But for me as a 15 year old girl who had had black friends when I was growing up just outside of Philadelphia, that I think it was like a softer sell for me that it was kind of like, okay, well, if there's like this black guy doing this, like, okay, like it wasn't as challenging like to my thought process. And there are other people who have um, entered into these uh, worldviews and networks that talk about their experience and they're like oh like if a baseball coach had just come around or whatever but for me I felt so personally worthless like I needed a place to go where I didn't have to be any good like I remember having the explicit thought as a 15 year old to be like well who's worse than the Nazis like they have to take me in like they're kind of really like the bottom of the social ladder like all I have to do is show up in my white body and the fact that I was like that I was so like I wanted to like destroy everything and fight everyone like but that was seen as like a huge asset like that was all that was required and I didn't feel like I had anything to offer anyone. And so what I had to offer was valued in, in those spaces. And I would end up traveling all over the country over, um, 
the next nearly five years living with different cells of um, mostly neo-Nazi skinheads, but um, you know, the other white supremacists through, throughout the country. Um, and eventually I didn't have anywhere to go. Uh, and so very luckily for me, the guy I was seeing at the time um, was in the army and he was a, a, a neo-Nazi. So this is definitely not a new problem. Probably 30 of my contacts while I was involved from in the late 80s, early 1990s uh, were active duty military. Um, that I had met his mom a couple weeks uh, previous to when I was like, I didn't have anywhere to go. And she said that I could come live with her. Um, she didn't know our ideology at the time, um, but like, it, you know, it, on the internet, you can see pictures of me while I was still active. And it's like, I don't know, like, it was definitely a leap of faith to see this, like, this hate-filled and vile creature that I had become show up on your doorstep and say, hey, would, you can come live with you know, me and my two 11 year old twin boys and my nine year old son. Um, so I left where I was living at the time uh, in Georgia and took a bus to Texas to go live with them. And when I walked in the door, multiple things began to happen. I was not super well connected with the white power scene where they lived in Texas. Um, and I was spending most of my time at the house. So my echo chamber is now broken up. So this normalization of, you know, of these, you know, of this belief system and the means of like viewing everything that we were doing, like this, this becomes completely disrupted. I start developing relationships with those little boys, reading them, you know, like, you know, the Chronicles of Narnia before bed and like throwing the football outside with them, good camping and fishing. Um, and begin to reconnect with some of the things that I didn't realize that I had lost while I was in like this, you know, like things like wonder and awe. And um, like, I still, like I remember the first day that I was like hanging out with them that I laughed, like full belly laughed in a way that wasn't like at someone's expense. And it wasn't sort of like sarcastically or ironically where it was just like, I was laughing because I was like, so, so joyful. Um, and I, I have a very visceral memory of, of that experience. Um, and then, you know, and so, you know, and I began to have these questions. It's like, well, I don't want these little boys to like do, like be involved in what I was involved with, right? Like I want to protect them. Like, I don't want them to like see the people that the couple of people that I knew where they were living that were involved in this stuff, like wanted to compartmentalize that, you know, and then I had to like think like okay well if I was willing to die for this why do I want to protect them from this why do I not want them to be exposed to this like what is that about um and like these you know other questions that I I had always continued to to like read poetry and stuff like that it's like how can I cry at the beauty of the English language and at the same time be filled with so much like hate and so much willingness to like do violence and began to kind of grapple with those ideas and like who like who do I want to be um and the mom that I was living with you know offered me genuine acceptance like genuine belonging that it was like I didn't have to prove myself through espousing an ideology or a willingness to use violence like I just had to like help with the dishes sometimes or whatever like she had no reason to take me in and chose to anyway like genuinely gave me this like sense of of belonging and stability and a sense of safety and the other thing that she did for me was to tangibly connect me with resources to begin to move my life forward that it she was like don't you like because I always like had all these books around me and stuff and she was like don't you want to like go to college or something but beyond that it was just like because if you do then like okay you need to take your SATs so like here's a number two pencil put it in your hand get in my car I'm gonna take you there I'll wait for you to be done your test and I you know like and I'll and I will bring you home and you know and did some of the things like it wasn't just like hey you should do a b and c it was like okay like but let me help you put these plans into action and help you actually begin to advance your life and it was within those conditions and i had lived there probably in uh, probably close to four to five months when i realized like that i had completely disaffiliated from um the the worldview and the um the networks that i had become so, so had become such a deep 
deep part of. Um, and, you know, I was like, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, this is not who I want to be going forward. Um, and so gently, you know, was able to kind of like step away from that. Um, and I would end up living at that house for almost a year. And I ended up going back home. Um, uh, I ended up going back home to go to like community college for a year so that I could like get into the college that I, that I really wanted to go to. However, um, it's a, it would be a false impression to say that I was like totally okay. Um, I was like, I was still a personal disaster. I still had a whole bunch of many layers of unprocessed trauma. I had not even begun to even understand like that I felt shame about what I had done and, and had any like skills or tools to healthfully process through that shame very many of my relationships while I was involved over those um, nearly five years were incredibly physically abusive. And so I like, I didn't have the skills and tools. So I was still like a mess of a human, but I was no longer directing the messiness of my humanness through, you know, this projection outwards of hate and violence towards, um, towards other people. I left the movement when I was about 20 years old, um, and the oldest of my kids was born when I was 23 uh, years old. I have seven kids uh, at this point. Um, and when he was born, I, you know, like I was just kind of like, okay, like I know I don't want my kids to be raised how I was raised. And I know I never want them to grow up and be like me. So the question became, like, how do I cultivate human beings who thrive, who will never look to hate or violence as a viable expression of anything going on in their lives? And that began this very immersive, purposeful, I mean, still ongoing, like, healing work um, that, um, that, I, that has been, like, so very integral um, to my life. And so I've taken all that and part of that healing, you know, and I, I was involved in like parenting support groups and breastfeeding support groups and stuff. And I chose to be very open and transparent about everything in my life that, I, you know, it's like, that, you know, just being open about talking about sexual assault, talking about the dysfunction in my family growing up and be very open that I had the, you know, that, that part of my life that I spent as a, as a, a neo-Nazi. What I didn't know is that by doing that, and the purpose for that in my life was that, like, I never wanted my kids to, like, ever stumble upon, like, oh, BT dubs, like, your mom was not, like, I just wanted that to be something that was, like, that we all knew from the beginning that, that we would talk about and practice talking about it with them before they got old enough to really, like, know, you know, to know what, what, what that meant or whatever. And so as we needed to have more complex conversations about that, that it was something that they had already, that they had already known. But a side effect of that was that people then became, um, felt safe to share the worst things that they had ever done and the worst things that had happened to, to them with me. And people began to reach out to me to be like, Hey, like my brother is involved, you know, as part of the clan, like, what, what do you think I can do for him? Um, or would you be willing to talk to him? And so I came into this work of mentorship, of mentoring people as they're leaving this stuff very organically. Um, it, in 2017, after Unite the Right in, in Charlottesville, like that work became like, I mean, just sort of completely exploded um, that um, people who had stories like mine and stuff became much more important for people to, uh, to write stories about and talk to. Um, so at this point, I have mentored a very, like, about 110 people um, who have been leaving. And, um, and then part of that too is, you know, so like the insights that I have come, not just like from my story, but from the commonalities of our stories collectively. Um, and to me, like, it wasn't, it's like, it's so hard to get people out of this stuff once they're immersed in it, that I, it was like, okay, well, but coupled with, you know, this idea of like, I have been parenting my children from this, like, 
prevention standpoint for my oldest is 24, you know, so like my, nearly my entire adulthood, I've been like, how do we help people not become Nazis in the first place? Um, that I began really trying to focus a lot of my energy on like, okay, well, what do we need to do to build genuine prevention? And like, how do we cultivate human beings who thrive, communities that allow people to thrive? How do we help you know, especially now in the age of the internet, like how do we help people be, you know, more empowered and better inoculated to the content that they're seeing? Um, how do we help them gain like emotional well-being and skills and communication skills and all of the things that I lacked and left me very vulnerable to this messaging? What does that, what would that look like and how do we implement that? And so those two things are really the focuses of, of my, the work that I do now or is this like rehabilitation and reintegration of people immersed in violence and also like building functional prevention models. And in order to be um, an effective, effective at both of those things that I, um, I have had to continue to sort of learn and monitor and watch and work with like community activists who are watching these spaces to continue to understand like how how these movements and networks and and everything are adapting and morphing and changing and growing and what is you know what what is what is emerging in terms of like well what are you know what are the kids that are out there now like what are they seeing how are they seeing this what what does it look like on social media what does this you know what are what are the messages messages that they're receiving who who are who's active and what different expressions and iterations of this are are currently active and so um you know i i've had to maintain um uh an a very fluid, uh, ongoing learning experience of what, you know, violent white supremacy um, and other um, hate based movements and worldviews and networks and stuff like actually look like. Mm. I, uh, that was not so short, was it? But I was no, trying. No, no, I was trying. Like, <laughs> it has to make it sense, was, though. It? That was not sure. The context is, the context is important. Uh, definitely, like in terms of that you you were part of this movement, but now you're helping people de-radicalize. Uh, first question I, I wanted to kind of pose to you was, how has the far right movement changed since the 1980s and 1990s? Because I, I, I think 2017 with Charlottesville, that shocked a lot of Americans like, oh, like this is the first time this has happened. But like, like, unfortunately, the white power movement has been a long part of American history going back to the Klan, uh, even during the 1980s and 1990s, people forget that Timothy McVeigh was very much part of the far right movement. But 2017 was like really the first time that it was on like the mainstream news and was being talked about. So how, uh, in, your, in your opinion, has the far right movement changed? Um, obviously the internet is a, is a complete game changer, right? That it's like, I, I talk about, you know, that people have multiple layers of trauma. They have these vulnerabilities in their lives um, that leave them susceptible to finding resonance with this messaging, right? Um, and they're very individual stories that are being lived out amongst a larger cultural story that, that we're living out. And, they, and there's this sort of like accident of timing and geography with which they collide and they're just like, okay, like I can find meaning here. Like maybe I feel like a sense of purpose and belonging here, um, a sense of agency, a sense of importance. This gives me an explanation for why the f world feels like a dangerous and threatening place. And this like, it offers me like a very easy to hold on to like group of others to blame for why the world, why I feel like I'm not thriving, why I feel like, I'm under threat or that everything that I should have, I don't have. Um, for, in my case, it was very unlikely that I would actually collide with like white power stuff because it had to happen in a physical space. Like I had to meet another like human being or have a physical, you know, book or record or something put into my hand. And now it's like, it's a hundred percent. If you have, if you are a person that has 
you know, a connection and access to the internet, you absolutely 100% will collide with these ideas, communities, you know, this content, like it is, it is a given. And I think as parents, if we don't assume that our children are 100% going to intersect with these things that we are making a grievous error. Um, so that is something that has definitely changed. At the, in the 90s, it was like right as I was leaving, maybe about a half a year before, um, before I left, that there was actually a big shift that was happening via this guy named Tom Metzger, who was out in California, and he was incredibly influential, and he, his idea was like, okay, like, we need to, like, shift the movement, and, like, everybody needs to, like, grow their hair out and really, like, integrate and infiltrate into wider society. So to get jobs like policing, go into the military and like get training, go into things like education, be part of like civil governments, um, to influence people from within the system, right? And so like that was an enormous shift rather than, you know, when you think of like skinheads, it was kind of, you know, it's kind of like street brawlers and it was just kind of, um, you know, it was just kind of sort of like shock troops or whatever. There's been a similar shift in like Proud Boys that pro the Proud Boys like began really as kind of, you know, that it was kind of like a, you know, boots on the ground kind of like street brawlers. And now they're like taking over local school boards and they're providing security for like larger events and stuff. And so this sort of like wider movement, like morphing that happens, like you can see just within, like if you read anything at all about the Proud Boys, that this is something that has actually like happened within their ranks since like 2017. Um, I think to um, some of the things that have changed, um, are um, one of the assumptions that people make about people who are involved in this stuff too is that they assume that people are very uneducated um, and you know that they're from the geographical like south they're pretty uneducated but I have found that most of the people that I mentor um, are people who are actually really smart um, and want to grapple with and engage with big ideas um, and that they have been dissuaded and sort of thwarted in that. And if you think in terms of like a lot of our schooling is not oriented around that, it's like sit down, be quiet, don't ask questions, comply, do the work, pass your tests or whatever. Um, and so like a lot of times these people are actually people who desperately want to engage in big ideas um, and don't really have anywhere to go and feel like shame and, and are shamed for wanting to engage in that. And so that there are vast like online communities, particularly as you get more like more towards the more violent end of the, the sort of like networks that are out there when we're talking about things like Adam Waffen division and stuff like that, that it's like most of the people that are involved in that are brilliant. They're super smart and they read vast amounts of like philosophy and philosophical literature and stuff. And like that it's, it's even like part of that. Um, there is an interesting sort of development. There's this guy named Rob Rundo and that there are these things called like active clubs that are happening and it's sort of like fitness based, but also coming back toward it, towards the like street action side of things. Um, that is, is kind of an interesting and, and disturbing uh, development um, that it's based also sort of on like self-improvement and things like that. So it's like as people are really grappling with the effects of the pandemic and, and things like that, that there's a lot of messaging that's in there um, that really like resonates with people that they're like, yeah, well, I want to be like better and, you know, like I want to be fit and, uh, and things like that. Um, but they're really 
focused on like very like, again, like sort of like local action, but it's much harder to like spot people that are involved. It's like, you know, like that there are still people that wear that actively wear like outward symbols that are easily identifiable. Um, but that there are a lot of people. And if you look, you know, I mean, Patriot Front was just in Washington, D.C. And it's like they're in they're still like in khakis and, you know, like that they look very respectable and everything. I think one of the other really important shifts um, that we are in the midst of is that um, the mainstream right has become increasingly has increasingly shifted over the last five years um, further towards the far right, while um, the mainstream left has remained pretty static where they are. So it's like this sense that we have like things are increasingly polarized on the one hand is true, but it's this one, this one set of like mainstream of the, of our two main political parties that has moved the Overton window <laughs> over and that within mainstream politics that far right talking points and beliefs have actually, um, have actually really entered like into the mainstream um, and the, yeah, the, I just heard a statistic that it's like as the elections come up that we're poised to have between 30 to 40 percent of America not accept the legitimacy of the results depending on what those results are. Um, and that that seems very highly, pro very highly problematic. Um, I would also say that the landscape of the far right um, has um, you know, it has increased in complexity to that when I was involved, so much of it was either, um, you know, that it was like survivalists or anti-government, um, sort of like separatists or whatever, or, or, or the Klan or like skinheads, right? And that, that was kind of, the, that was kind of like the lay of the like white power land. And now it's like, there's so many different iterations and so much complexity within the landscape. Um, and that there are different parts. And if, you know, if you include things in that landscape, such as like QAnon and things like that, that it's like that there are iterations of this that really tap into like every age demographic, like, you know, that, that, you know, if your kids are on TikTok, that there's an iteration that's like totally like there that they'll find, they'll very likely like find an encounter and perhaps find resonance with if your, you know, your grandma is, you know, seven years old and watching, you know, um, OAN or whatever to, as her main news source or whatever, it's like, she's being exposed to stuff. And so like, the, I think that this increased complexity and exposure is, um, is an immense difference from how things were, you know, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've, I think that there, that is a common misnomer with the far right, that they're kind of uneducated, they live in trailer parks, but we, uh, have seen that a lot of the people that are leaders in this movement actually either were like dropouts of PhD programs. Richard Spencer actually dropped out of a PhD program in, I believe, history at Duke. Uh, the leader of the Oath Keepers actually has uh, his law degree. And so I, I think it's important to like see the movement as something that it can be very like it there. It's filled with educated people that have really horrible racist ideas and they know how to spread those ideas and that's what makes it so uh so so terrible and so uh has a lot of unfortunate potential i want to uh now kind of blend it in with an audience q a because we have about 15 to 20 minutes maureen do you want to you want to take over yes sure we have a, a couple questions from the audience shannon um, I'll ask the first one, and that is, um, what was your opinion on the 2021 United States Capitol riots? So, I am um, uh, uh, when I, you know, when I'm when I when I don't have paid work, it's to, I, I work as a bartender, and I was actually working. It was uh, a rooftop bar. Um, so it was open during the pandemic and I was actually working at the bar, um, the day that that happened. And I put in my notice the next day cause I knew I was about to get really busy. 
um, because when the world gets really bad, people tend to uh, reach out to me uh, much more robustly. Um, so I watched most of that unfold while I was watching it. I mean, when people um, in like uh, community organizing spaces and people like me, like I like when I knew that that was gonna like it was not shocking to me. Like I was just like we all knew like this was gonna happen. I don't I don't know, you know I. Not sure why um, there wasn't more robust um, police or National Guard presence there. That is a question definitely that should at some point maybe be answered. I don't know. I don't know if we're ever going to get any answers from the January 6th commission. Um, but we all knew it was going to happen. And then as they, as they went to the Capitol, like my one thought was like, like, please just don't let anyone die, especially like don't let any women die so that there are no martyrs. Um, and as we know, unfortunately, that there, that there were several people killed that day, one of whom was a woman. Um, and, um, you know, and I know like with absolute certainty that it was, um, you know, that not Antifa and it was not like the feds or whatever that um, I, um, that there that there was a concerted um, discussion amongst like leftist organizers and local anti-fascists to not go at all, to not have opposition, so that when the violence we all knew was going to happen happened, that it would be unambiguous where that violence um, stemmed from. Uh, words matter a lot. Um, I would. Say Say that it was um, an insurrection. I would say that it was definitely a coup attempt. Um, that those are my personal opinions on that. Um, I think that there were a lot of people who were there that had no intention of of doing of doing any of that. That were really just there, like they, you know, that they were they were there. They were there in support of the president that they really believed in um, and things like that and that they just happened to be there and caught up in the moment. But there is ample evidence that there was immense coordination by like three percenters, by Proud Boys um, and other groups that there were coordinated efforts um, and organizing efforts to make that happen and that there was a forethought out plan specifically in place for invading the Capitol and disrupting it. And that the intention was murderous um, is my, is my like heartfelt belief that, the, that they were trying to murder John Pence and Nancy Pelosi and that they were dead, that they were completely trying to disrupt um, democracy on that day. Okay, and another question that um, someone asked was, what was, what is one thing that everybody can do to help support the fight against extremism? One thing. <laughs> I might end up with more than one thing. <laughs> um, I think, um, get to know your neighbors. Get to know your neighbors and build strong communities. Um, even if your neighbors don't necessarily like totally agree with you or whatever, um, get to know your neighbors, help one another out, um, and support each other. Um, a whole lot of us like have barely ever had conversations with our, you know, with our immediate neighborhood. Um, think about what you can do to build a, you know, a strong, very local community. Can you guys share food? Can you get to know each other? Um, can you have conversations like even with people that like still have their like Trump signs out or whatever? It's like, hey, I don't want to talk about politics with you because we're never going to agree on that. But like, what did you think about that? You know, like wild dog that ran through the neighborhood the other day or whatever. Like having those very per personal one on one conversations um, with our neighbors, I think, is something that is robust 
robustly um, important. Um, and to look at ourselves for the ways that we might need to improve and heal our own lives, like in our emotional skill building, our, communi our healthy communication building, like what are the things that we can focus on? Can we identify the ways that we, our personal lives have been affected by um, the intersections our own lives have with um, different systems of oppression and stuff like that. Like how have we personally been impacted because we all have been um, and what can I do to address those? So I would say personal healing coupled with starting with like getting to know your neighbors and building strong communities, I think is something that like we all have the capacity to do. We just have to kind of like set our discomfort aside that has kept us from that um, uh, hitherto. The next two questions are, are kind of related, so I'll ask them together. Um, how much did your boyfriend's mother know about your extremist life when you, you went there? So did you, do you think she was trying to de-radicalize you or was she just being truly supportive? And then um, just coupled on with that is at first, did you hide that you were in a radical movement um, or did you, you know, just decide that become seen in public with it? So I was never, I, I, it was only a couple years ago that I found out that she had no idea. She had no idea that what my beliefs that my, and her son, her oldest son, like had no idea that we were like neo-Nazis. I didn't hide it. Like I, you know, I had white power tattoos. I had white power symbols on like my jacket that I wore. So like I wasn't, I was not you know, consciously like trying to like hide what I was. I wasn't throwing up like Sieg Hiles in her house or, or anything like that. Um, and, you know, I mean, and I, you know, I, I knew that, that that was not like her belief system. So I wasn't throwing out like racial or ethnic slurs, um, you know, like in her home. So there was like this part of me that knew like, okay, like that's not okay to do here or whatever. Um, but it was not something that I, remember at the time having any, you know, any, like any sort of conscious idea of like, oh, I'm going to like hide who I am or whatever. Um, but I always assumed like, of course she knew, but I found out just a few years ago that she had no, like she had no idea that she had absolutely no idea. Um, and um, actually uh, when, when I found that out that she was just like, no, I like, I loved having you there. Like it was like one of the favorite, one of my favorite parts of my life was like having you like live with me at home. Like you, like what you brought to our family was really amazing, which was like, so like difficult for me to hear. Like, why? Like, I, oh my God, like, like what, <laughs> like, what are you, what are you even talking about with that? <laughs> Well, and I have um, one question for you, and that is um, in your work with trying to de-radicalize um, people, what have you found to be the most effective way in doing so? So I am, um, I actually don't, um, I'm actually not a super big fan of like the term de-radicalizing, right? Like I'm kind of like, I don't, I don't really think radicalization is the problem. Like, you know, it's like, you work a 40 hour work week and if your kids who are like 10 years old aren't working in factories like 15 hours a day like you have radicals to thank for that right so like this idea that like radicalism is bad I I I personally don't really like hold with that right that the problem that we have is like with hate and violence and dehumanization right like it's like aggressive violence and dehumanization and if your worldview is based on those things or utilizes those things as tools that 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 that's really the problem so i look at it more as this like disengagement and disaffiliation from those things and then how do we help how do we help you re-engage in like pluralistic living and and society right like how do we help you move like into this pluralistic space. Um, I, I think for the people that we have in our lives that we're just like, oh my gosh, the most important thing that we can do is understand our, our own boundaries. Like what conversations are we willing to have? Um, are we willing to like talk about politics? Are we, you know, like, are we willing to like, while they're sorting through stuff, um, are we willing to hear anti-Semitic or racist language? Um, 
really get clear on what our boundaries are and what we have the capacity for, and then communicating those boundaries and enforcing them, right? That um, I, I don't personally very often argue with someone about their belief system because I find it to be a pretty ineffective use of time. That um, I, my approach is to like ask questions, right? And just to assume that they got to what their belief system because, because they care a lot. Because if they didn't, like they would just be like, whatever, right? That they care a lot, that they've spent a lot of time and energy like coming to the system. And so asking a lot of questions like, oh, well, why do you believe that? Oh, and like, yeah, I don't agree with that. Like, that's not my, my view. But like, can you tell me why, like, why that's true for you? And like, oh, well, you said this thing and this thing, and they seem um, like they're hypocritical. Can you tell me, like, how do you, how do you wrestle that out in your mind? Like, how, how, how do those things, like, fit consistently for you in the way that you view, view the world or whatever? Um, and at the same time, being really clear, like, they, like, this is not, like, I don't believe these things, but, like, I'm going to insist, like, part of it for me is this insistence on, like, treating them at deeply human, right? That um, when you are immersed in this stuff, it's not just that you are dehumanizing others, but in the process of dehumanizing others, you yourself become dehumanized. You yourself become less than human, that you have cut off um, your outward facing empathy and that it's, you know, sort of like my belief that it's like the thing that makes us human is this like outward facing empathy that we have this ability to like feel and have compassion for the people around us and that's shut off. So this process of helping people like disaffiliate and disengage is like, I'm going to like help you rehumanize yourself, right? And so that you like feel worthy of connection in other spaces and that like do you have a sense of that you can potentially belong somewhere other than in this, you know, in this what turns out to be a very vacuous space. Um, and to have those conversations and it's like to stay connected with people um, and offer them out of echo chamber connection. And again, like this all depends on your personal capacity. Like many people have had to be like, I got to cut them out of my life because it's destroying me. And like, and that's totally, totally fine. But if you're able to maintain connection, even if it's just sending like, hey, I was on a hike and I saw this beautiful sunset. Here's a picture of it. Or like, here's this funny meme that I came across or whatever. Oh, like I talked to so-and-so and I thought of you or you're on my mind or whatever. Just maintaining out of echo chamber experiences and connection so that if they get to a point where they begin to question that they know that they have somewhere to go, that if people feel like they don't have anywhere to go and they only have this like, very enclosed like echo chamber that when they kind of when they begin having doubts the only place to go is actually like further and deeper in and they become more likely to engage um in violence from that so it's trying to like maintain that that out of echo chamber experience and it's incredibly hard right because it's like people like me like i was a human being but i was engaged in horrible things like i did horrible horrible things while i was involved um, that I hurt people and hurt communities um, and inflicted like terror on, you know, communities of faith and things like that through graffitiing and, and flyering and, and things like that. Um, that it's like trying to, so holding those things all at the same time where it's just like, I am going to robustly insist on seeing you as human. You might be a human engaged in very horrible, awful, terrible things. Um, that are not okay and I don't need to make excuses for or to normalize or say are okay, but I am going to just like absolutely like fiercely treat you as human. And I think we have time for one more question and um, I'll ask uh, this question that one of our students asked and that would is, would you say that the education level separate the leaders from the followers in these movements? Uh, no, uh, not overly. And, and some of it depends on, um, some of it depends too on the iteration that, um, confusing, there's like a shift away from, 
movementarianism. So when I was in, it was kind of like a white power movement, right? And now I like, I feel like framing this with the language of like networks, right? Because of the way that the internet works and that there's like all this crossover, um, you know, and everybody sort of has access to one another um, and that there's just sort of like different expressions or iterations that hit sort of like different demographics. Um, that, and m many, many of which are very decentralized and that there are no like leaders. Um, things like Adam Vlaffen division and Fear Creek division and, um, you know, things like that, that there, that is very decentralized where there is no leader, that there are only like small cells that e that only even come into existence to organize, to be able to carry out like terrors or whatever, to, to, to do actions. Um, and I would say that it does that the educational differences doesn't are not really the thing that divides that divides people. But that is also not to say that they're you know I mean I don't know like even going way back like William Luther Pierce and George Lincoln Rockwell both had like PhDs that there have historically been leaders. Um, and Goebbels had a PhD um, in, the, in the like Nazi and, and, you know, over like white supremacist scene that there is a history of people having like very, you know, having advanced degrees um, and things like that. But at this point, I would not say that that's an, a, an accurate representation of the sort of dichotomy of like leaders and followers. Um, that there are leaders that are insofar as that there are parts of this that like iterations of this that have like leaders um, that they are not necessarily more highly educated well, that would be followers and iterations where that that, that sort of uh, power dynamic exists at all. Thank you. So and like, and I have a few more minutes. Like, if there are more questions that people would like to ask, if you guys have a few more minutes, I t I also like have I also have a few more minutes. I know we got started late. Sure. Well, how about we'll do we'll do. Uh, I have been looking through the Q and A here. Um, I I like this question by an anonymous attendee. Have Have you ever had anyone try to radicalize you again? or try to get you back into the movement. I guess ra radicalize is that the term that you like that you said, but you, you, you get yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Like, especially like when I'm like mentoring people and they're like, hey, well, what about this or whatever, you know? <laughs> um, but I will also say that it is my, it is my working hypothesis right now that so, that, uh, anecdotally, right? Like this is just me and the experience of me and the people that I have mentored. So this is like not a scientific fact. And like, this is, um, there is a study that came out um, a couple years ago that seems to support this by this guy named Pete Simi um, and this other professor, amazing professor named uh, Dr. Kathleen Blee. And that seems to support this. Um, but that we're talking mainly about people who have like high, what's called A scores, adverse childhood experiences, um, or in another word, like multiple layers of trauma. Um, and um, people who have these like multiple layers of trauma, like for the rest of our lives, our brains are kind of like, are very susceptible to um, engaging in things in ways so it's like people who have like multiple because your brain is trying to keep you alive right like if you have all this trauma um, your brain's working really hard to keep you alive that it's like it's trying to interpret danger right so it shuts part of itself off to to bring to the forefront of your life like identifying threats in your life and, you know, and our brains are adapted like this to keep us alive that it's like we're going to shut down all the extra stuff and we're going to go on like like super high alert for threats. Um, and by doing that, it's like, it leaves you very susceptible to like looking for very dogmatic and prescriptive ways of being. So it's like, in order to be a good person, you do X, Y, and Z. And you know, like, here's what you do. And these are the bad people, and these are the good people, and these things are dangerous, and these things aren't. Um, and to engage with things in a way where it's just like, okay, like in order to like, be good and be safe. I have to do these rules or whatever. And so 
it's something that, um, like I know personally for me, I have to be ever vigilant about. And so things like, um, you know, even like, even like exercise or something like that, that I have to make sure all the time that it's like, okay, I, I can exercise, but it, the susceptibility for me of becoming just sort of like the exercise person and like, and that that's all I do that I have to like in my family with my, with my seven kids that we are one of our like family mottos is like, is shoe simplicity and embrace complexity that I have to make sure that I am always engaging in things in a very complex way, knowing that I am incredibly susceptible to re-engaging in things in this sort of black and white, very simplistic way where it's just like, okay, like this is the biggest thing and engaging in things in this sort of like over the top way. So I have to be vigilant and will have to be for the rest of my life um, about that, about all that, like for sure. Um, and there have definitely been people that I've been working with who have completely tried to like just be like yeah but don't you really like eh, want to want to do this um this will be the the final question uh it's also from an anonymous attendee what can we do for family who are becoming more extreme or any do you have any advice uh, to help bring them back i think that you know as you mentioned we've kind of seen the, some of the mainstreaming of these far-right ideas i think about the, uh, the great replacement theory has gotten, uh, unfortunately, some uh, airtime on some of our na major national news channels. Uh, so what do we do in terms of family members that have gone a bit too far, uh, that have gone to the far right or are starting to embrace some of the tenets and principles that are part of that movement? Some of that depends on, on the dynamic that we're talking about. Because there are students, um, that if you're talking about like your parents, like that dynamic is going to be maybe a little bit different than if we're talking about parents and their children, or like, if you're talking about like cousins or, or, you know, or whatever, um, the first thing, so I won't answer this as though I am talking to students that, that, that this is a student question. Um, the first thing is to build your support structure, um, and, try to find um, definitely supportive peers, but also uh, like at least one or two supportive adults in your life that, um, that you have um, who you can talk to. Um, making sure that you have people that you can check in with and just be like, oh, I feel like super overwhelmed by all this. Um, the second thing is, you know, again, like it's really I really work to like understand what your boundaries are like what are you willing to talk about what are you willing to engage what you know what kind of conversations like pay attention to like how you feel after those conversations or whatever um and, and it's okay, like for your boundaries to change too, that it's like, I thought I could talk about politics with you, but I think that we really can't, like, we're not going to find common ground. So I don't want to talk about this with you. And then the hardest part is just being like, I told you, I didn't want to talk about politics and I'm going to like walk out of this room or, you know, I, or just to do it, even if you're stuck in the car with them or whatever, just be like, I told you we're not, I'm not engaging in conversation with this with you. Like, I, like, I love you, but we, I can't talk about this with you. And that it takes immense courage and that that is really, 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 really hard to do. And we don't have a lot of practice overwhelmingly, um, particularly as, um, you know, young adults, like we haven't really been upheld and taught very well how, how to do that. Um, but the other thing too is to um, invite them into your world um, and um, whenever possible and if that and if that feels safe for you to do and whether that's like hey I just watched this show or I want to watch this show would you watch it with me so we can talk about it even if it's like whatever it is like even if, like I don't care if it's like adventure time I don't care like you know I don't like I totally don't care like what it is but like whatever it is that like you love and that's very important to you just invite your family member like hey would you do this thing with me and even if the other side of that is like, you know, I, like, and then why don't you pick something? And even if it's like terrible or whatever, and then just like 
to be like, oh, hey, can we like, if, if this is within your boundary set, to be like, oh, hey, would you want to talk about this or whatever? Like, what did you love about that? Um, and I have found, and this is a tool that I utilize a whole lot, like in person is to try to like, take people out like to go on hikes or in get like walk along the beach or like go to a museum or just to get outside and go do stuff to like get away from the signal get them away from the tv or you know facebook or you know or telegram or whatever it is that they're on all of the time like if you have the ability to say like i really want to go do this thing outside with you like let's put our phones away and just be to get whether it's playing tennis anything like that like if you are able to schedule like a regular you know activity that you do and like literally whatever that is. and if they you know like whatever it is like i don't even care if it's like beer pong like i'm playing beer pong with my dad every thursday it doesn't matter like how, if you are able to have like a regular thing that you do that involves not being connected to the signal um, that you engage in, that that helps maintain that connection and also helps, you know, like it's very difficult if you are a young person and you're just like, I'm losing my parents or I'm losing my grandparents or whatever. Like there's so, and allow yourself to feel the sorrow and the grieving of that. Um, uh, that because it's it's incredibly sad that I have heard so many of those stories but if you are able to like maintain some sort of like regular offline thing that you do that that can be really important and I would also say like reach out and look and read you know um, texts and literature of you know some of from some of the like leftist organizing like become educated, understand like the power of like building strong communities and getting to know your neighbors and like doing things like even just like growing food or whatever and like how that can be this sort of like act of resistance or whatever and it's like I don't know if you're like growing a tomato plant or whatever and that's your little covert way of just being like well I'm standing my ground <laughs> like whatever else is happening in my household like I'm engaging and like I can I might not be able to do much for anyone right now but I have some tomatoes I can give to other people um, that that can just be the sort of like little secret personal like act of resistance that that you have just to just be like okay like I'm gonna stand strong um or whatever and also like give it cut yourself some slack like love make sure you love yourself first and foremost and take just amazing care of of yourself because that is a very radical act um to insist on just completely robust self-love particularly when we are immersed in family systems where um, things are not super awesome for us. I think that's a very positive point to end on. Uh, and I just wanna take this moment to thank you, Shannon, for spending time with BCU students. Uh, and I also wanna thank uh, the Virginia Holocaust Museum for supporting this event. The Virginia Holocaust Museum is a really great uh, museum here in the Richmond community. Uh, and if, you have the opportunity to visit it, I highly recommend that you do so. So I just wanna, again, thank you, Shannon, uh, and also thank our attendees for coming on uh, Thursday night to uh, engage with us. So I really, really appreciate it. And so thank and you. And I would just like to say, if anyone has questions or if like after you like sit with this, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, the organizers have um, my email address. I'm on, you know, Twitter. I'm very easy to find. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out. If you have questions that you are sitting with or that come up in the next few days, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, sometimes I have a little bit of lag in like answering my email. Um, but, um, and if that is true, don't feel bad about sending a follow up. Hey, <laughs> did, did, did this go to the bottom of your inbox or whatever? Um, but please don't sit with unanswered questions. I am so happy to, um, to, to speak with any of the students, any, anyone who is watching who potentially has questions that were left unanswered, please reach out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shannon. We appreciate that. And, and thanks right. everyone for showing up. Yeah, Have a great definitely. night. Definitely. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you.